There we go. Got to turn buttons on sometimes. Don't touch any microsoft. Tell ya. My wife bakes amazing croissants, by the way. We have a good father. We have a good father, and he gives us many good things, including croissants and microphones that work. Um, I am reminded of Psalm 23, where we sing about and we think about and we remember, perhaps, if this is a psalm that you have memorized, where it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Through those verses and other verses like that, the Bible says to you, you are invited to God's house, to to sit at his table and enter into relationship with him. Just like you might be planning on this afternoon, going home or going out with friends and family, and being together, going to a house, sharing a meal Imagine that kind of relationship you are invited to with God. But the devil, he wants anything but that for you. In fact, he will use any means possible to distract you so that you don't hear that invitation or you don't sit, you don't be still and enjoy God's presence. And he will give you good things to look at or allow you to see and then cause your heart to think, now there's happiness. And you might think, boy, if I could get that next promotion, I know I'll be happy. If I can graduate school, if I can survive the next test and then, and then go and get a job. And then, you know, if this, this girl or if this guy likes me, right? Or if I can get into, get into the right program at school. If I can get the next I this or I that, right? Then we think we'll be happy. Then we'll we'll have security if we get that new home in the new neighborhood. Or we'll be significant if we can establish our prowess. And all the time, we're just chasing after the newest and the latest and the greatest. But we have been so distracted. We haven't had the focus nor the time to hear God's voice, to be still and to sit at his table and enjoy fellowship with him. So Pastor Nick invited me uh, to come and to preach today on the 10th and final commandment. Uh, in case we haven't had the opportunity to meet and you're like, who is this dude? I'm Ben Webb, the, the ministry, uh, celebration ministry director. So I'm more comfortable in front of a keyboard or a guitar, um, but today I get to share with you God's word and it is an honor. And the commandment we are looking at is in Exodus 20, 17. If you know the 10th commandment by heart, you know it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. As I studied that passage in the last few weeks, I was blessed, I was convicted, but I was freed. As God made it clear to me, and I pray that he will for us this morning as we share God's word together, You shall not covet is commanded so that we can know the God who is trustworthy and be content in his provision. Before we dig in, though, let's pray together one more time and invite the Holy Spirit to do his work in our hearts. Lord Jesus, we need you this morning. We've sung of it. We're going to hear your word. We need you, Holy Spirit to make these more than just words on a page or a screen or from my mouth, but that you would apply them to our hearts. Show us the glory of the gospel. Show us our need of your grace. Show us your love, that lives would be transformed in this room, tuning in online. Have your way among us, we pray in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You shall not covet. It's commanded so that we would know God is trustworthy, and that we would be content in his provision. If you remember, uh, in the 
Exodus 20 and these Ten Commandments, the scene is you're at a, they're at a mountain. The Israelites are receiving the commandments and God is revealing himself in mighty ways and speaking in mighty ways to them. And he gives this commandment so that they would know him, right? We've seen in all these other commandments, not only are they commands, but they show something about who God is. In this commandment, we see that God is a good provider. If you're familiar with the context of the commandments, we had the Israelites early in Exodus. They were slaves in Egypt. God comes and redeems them, leads them through the Red Sea. They journey through the desert where they face thirst, and God provides. They face hunger, and God provides. They face attack, and God provides protection. And we get to this point in their story, and God commands, don't covet, don't look for happiness, security, significance in these other things, because I am your provider. And when we think about coveting, think of desire and wanting and finding pleasure in things, but it's more, it's more like when we go beyond just enjoying the good thing God gives us, right? He's good. He's our provider. But when we go beyond enjoying those things, we covet them when we think that that stuff is what makes us happy. That that stuff we can get is what makes us secure or significant. In fact, coveting is really idolatry. But don't take my word for it. Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says it concisely. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. In fact, we see this in the story of Exodus itself, just a few chapters later, in chapter 32. The people of Israel are still at the base of the mountain. Moses has been up worshiping and talking with God for weeks, and the people of Israel begin to fear, begin to doubt God's provision. Where, where is God? He's talking to Moses, but we have to go through the desert. We have to go fight with these wars. How are we going to be safe and secure and happy? And they command Aaron to take the good things God gave them and make them literally a God thing. They fashion this golden calf and they, they worship it, thinking that will protect and provide. But God commands, thou shalt not covet, so that they would depend on God as their provider. And today, as we read that, we can know that we can depend on God as our provider too, because this isn't just for the Israelites. Hebrews 13.8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if we're still wondering, can we trust God to provide, you have to look no further than the cross. Right? Jesus, born as a baby, lived a perfect life. He's God in the flesh, but yet he died on the cross to pay the penalty for sin. Not his own, he had none. But the penalty for your sin. Jesus is God's perfect provision for you. Not only that, as Paul says in Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Yes, God reveals he is our provider, but in commanding us not to covet, he's also revealing our own sin. Romans, again the Apostle Paul in chapter 7, verse 7, makes this all too painfully clear. He says, Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would have not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness, for apart from the law, the sin lies dead. Whether we like it or not, the reality is you may be a very nice person, you may be a solid Lutheran, been here for years, you may be tuning on the line and you're thinking you're, you're decent, but the reality is each of us 
have a sinful nature. You may be a redeemed child of God, hallelujah, but until the day when you die and rise again or Jesus returns, there is still within us sin. And the Bible says that sin, it's not just like maggoty rags and stinkiness before God. It's so offensive we have no opportunity, no hope in a million to enter into God's house and have fellowship with him. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, sin produces in us all kinds of covetousness that chases relentlessly after the the next exciting, newest, best thing because that's going to make me happy. In his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, John Mark Comer, he warns believers that most of us believe the lie that the more you have, the happier you will be. He says, get that new dress or pair of shoes or golf club or geometric potted cactus and naturally you'll be happier. Trade in your car for the new model. It has LED lights around the logo. Nab the bigger, better home or condo or apartment and make sure you furnish it with the latest design trend, preferably from Sweden or Australia. Work your way up the ladder, throw an elbow out if you have to, but get the promotion, the raise, the bonus. And when you, if and when you do, you'll be happier. Duh. Everybody knows that. Happiness is out there. It's just one PayPal click. War outfit or gadget or car payment or mortgage away. Out of reach, yes, but barely. I'm almost there. I can feel it. But let me say what you all know. The carrot dangling in front of our noses is attached to a stick. Jesus himself warns us. Luke chapter 12. One's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And then he goes to tell a parable about a rich man, or at least he becomes rich, right? He plants a crop and it yields bountifully. And instead of using that crop to provide for his needs and then give and bless others and be rich towards God, Jesus says in this parable, the man puts it in a barn and kicks up his feet with a lemonade. I threw that in. And he says, I'm going to relax and have it made for the rest of my life. Which turned out to be one night. And he passed away. And then all the stuff that he had was worthless. And the reality is, as Jesus says, Life isn't in our stuff. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 6, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. Again, John Mark Comer in his book, he says, you simply can't live the freedom way of Jesus and get sucked into overconsumption that is normal in our society. The two are mutually exclusive You have to pick. So are we looking for our happiness, excitement, security, satisfaction, significance in our shopping cart? And if you're in my generation, that's literally like the little button in your phone where you put that thing that you want and then you consider it for, if you're not an impulse buyer, you consider it for a little while and it gets you excited. "Mm -hmm, Nothing wrong with good things, but where we find our happiness, God says, He is our provider, who's trustworthy. He is good. And his command, thou shalt not covet, it exposes the sin in my heart that produces all kinds of covetousness. And if that wasn't bad enough, focusing on that problem to fix it only makes it worse. To illustrate that, let me say, um, hypothetically, if I were to tell you for the next next five minutes, Do not itch or scratch. (laughs) And all of a sudden, you're like, I think there's something crawling up me right now. You hadn't considered it before, but now there's an, an urge. In fact, you might call it a want. You might call it a need. I have a scratch. I need, I see you. Right? The more we focus on our problem, the worse it becomes. So how... So rather than in our own efforts and in our own strength, I'm not going to covet, I'm not going to covet, what are we to do? I 
I suggest, and I think Scripture would tell us, we just sit at the table. We grow and focus on our relationship with God. And once He fills us with His satisfaction and contentment, then the other stuff fades away. I've been reading in a Bible reading plan called Connect the Testaments. Highly recommend it. You read a few verses and then a devotional. And one of the days recently, they said this, and it caught my attention. We can always choose where to place our attention. Often, we turn our attention toward preventing something, sin, at the cost of doing something good, growing in the Lord. When we keep our focus on our relationship with Christ, we can rise above our circumstances and find victory. So let me ask you, gathered in the room, you watching online, do you have a relationship with Jesus? One that looks like going to his house, just connecting, eating, sharing a meal together, And maybe to you that seems like ridiculous. You've heard of God. He's the angry one who gives commandments. Or you've you've maybe known a little bit about him and the thought of a relationship just kind of seems cuckoo. And I encourage you, before you walk out this door, come come forward after the service. We're going to have prayer ministers where you you can ask, you can pray, what does it mean? How can I have a relationship with Jesus? But let me share with you now that A relationship with God begins by acknowledging that you haven't got it. That I can't, in any amount of my efforts, enter into God's house and have that relationship. My sin is too much. Where we look to Jesus, who died on the cross in faith, and say, I need you. In fact, the Bible spells it out. Romans chapter 10, 9 through 10. It says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved For it is with your heart you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth you confess and are saved. And if you do have that relationship, how do you deal with covetousness is you focus on growing. Spend time with Jesus in his word. Maybe you're like my wife and the moment you get up, it's busyness of work, kids, school, whatever it might be, and there isn't a moment until your head hits the pillow and you open up God's Word and you fellowship with Him. Great. If you're like me, um, more of a morning person, there's that really painful, wink, 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 at 6.30 a.m., and you just go, oh, no. But then, once my mind clears a little bit, I remember, wait, and I get out of bed. Sometimes I fall. You saw the video last week, don't judge. But I get out of bed And I'm excited because I get to grab a cup of coffee and I get to sit down with Jesus. I get to to read his word and hear him speak to my heart. I get to pour out in prayer my concerns and my joys and I get to fellowship. And it's in that place where where covetousness and other things begin to lose their grip because he contents my heart. Other ways you can grow and focus on your relationship with Jesus is getting into a Bible study like we have here at church or a home group. Do a Bible reading plan like Connect the Testaments or memorize scripture. I use this app, shameless plug, but if it works, use it, called Bible Memory, where literally you memorize verses, it keeps track of them, and then it reminds you to review them. And it has, it's been helpful for me, but commit it to memory. Ask someone to help you know Jesus better. Maybe um, there are some kindergartners in this room where reading the Bible isn't an option for you yet. Or you're tuning in online, playing with your toys like my kids probably are. Listen up. If you don't know yet how to read the Bible, ask your mom and dad. Will you read the Bible to me before I go to bed so that I can know Jesus? Or ask them, would you buy me a Bible or this big word called devotional so that I can know Jesus better? Or saying yes to Jesus when he prompts you to do something is a fantastic way to walk with Jesus and know him better. Maybe he's been nudging you to finally go to that missions informational meeting you keep hearing about. 
Maybe he's nudging you to volunteer in Sunday school. Maybe he's nudging you to sit next to that kid you've been noticing at school who's all by him or herself, or loving your family, or calling a relative, or discipling someone. God is so good. He's a provider. He commands us not to covet so that we can know he's trustworthy and be content in his provision. Thinking about that story of Exodus and the Ten Commandments, the context, if you read in chapter 19 at some point, it says after he redeemed the people from slavery, God uses language like, you are now mine, my chosen people. You are my priesthood. I have made you my own. And the amazing, mind-blowing thing, we read this very same language in 2 Peter. Is it 2nd? 1st. 1st Peter 2. There's the 2. 1st Peter 2, 9. You, speaking to you, if you believe in Jesus, are a chosen royal priesthood, a chosen nation, a people for his own possession, that you might declare the praises of him who called you from darkness into his marvelous light. I love the way the NIV translates 1 John 3.1. See what kind of love the Father lavishes on you, that you should be called children of God, for that is what we are. Psalm 16, it's a great verse. Psalm 16.11, that speaks to why we can be content in our relationship with God. It says... You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In a relationship with God, you have joy that cannot be taken away by circumstances of any nature. As a good, loving Father, God provides for us And he also allows us to go through testing. Testing. We see that in our chapter of Exodus 20. After the Ten Commandments are given, Moses says to the Israelites, Do not fear, for God has come to test you. What? Like, that would make me fear. God is going to test you. But why would God want to test the Israelites? He made them. He knows what's in them. The idea of testing in this Hebrew word also has the idea of train. If you were to go ahead and read through 1 Kings, you come across the story of a little boy, David, and a giant, Goliath, right? And David is going to go fight this Goliath giant, and the king of Israel gives him his armor to wear. Now, it's probably not like the medieval armor, but if that's all you got in your mind, picture that. And he's trying, and it says literally, he tries in vain to go. And he says, I cannot use this, for I have not tested it. Clearly, David wasn't worried that the armor would help him not die immediately. It had protective qualities. But he said, I have not tested it. He hadn't trained with it. He hadn't had it fitted to him. He wasn't prepared with it. So when Moses says the Lord is testing you, it's that idea of the Lord is preparing. He's training you not to covet. And if that seems unfair, consider Hebrews chapter 5, 8, and 10. It talks about how Jesus was tested. Jesus, the beloved Son of God, was trained. And if he was trained, so too will we. But if he is victorious, we can look to him as our hope in times of testing. And honestly, sometimes it is hard to trust that God is going to provide for us. This is a crazy world. We might honestly wrestle with fear and doubt. Where is my next paycheck coming from? Where am I going to find a roof? Where am I going to find clothing? Where am I going to find happiness and significance and satisfaction? We fear that. Full disclosure. On the other hand, you might hear the message that God is your provider and think, cool, I don't got to do nothing. He's going to have to provide. And you have those extremes, fear or uh, let's call it laziness. That's what it is. But neither of those 
is grounded in a relationship where you know Jesus. You know who God is. You know his character. And again, that is what we must put our attention to. I recently experienced some minor testing. Didn't feel minor at the time, but looking back, yes, it was minor. Where my confession before you all, early midlife crisis, I wanted a truck. (laughs) Men in the room know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, good. Um, But there's something in me, and it's like, I want a truck. Um, And we, uh, Katie and I, have been saving to replace our vehicle, and I had been researching for months. I took the boys out to the dealer. We had a blast. Granted, one of the sons was more interested in the popcorn than the trucks. And I, we tested a couple, and I was like, oh, I think I found the one. It's in the budget. It looks nice. And it, it, it fits our needs. And so I went home that night, and I was so excited, like thinking tomorrow, out goes the van, in comes the truck. And I talk with my wife, and slowly but surely, her wisdom begins to sink in. <laughs> and I realize, this isn't the right time. And there's this little boy in me that, whose dreams were just crushed. And I felt so sad. And Katie, in her loving compassion, looks over at me and starts to laugh. She busts a gut. She's like, really? You want a truck? We've been married for 12 years, and now you... Oh, oh, Lord bless her. A little hurt. But you know what? I could content myself in saying no. I could give up that dream that I thought was a need, that I realized was a want, because I was content in my relationship with God. I didn't need this thing. But that wasn't the end of it because that's the beginning of the summer. I jog around the neighborhood and it seems like every other stinking driveway is a brand new truck. And every time I pass one, it's an opportunity for the Lord to train me, not as I jog, but in my heart. I am content in my Father. I do not need that. My minivan, it still rolls mostly. But... She did buy me a truck for my birthday. We can show that on the screen. It's shiny, it's red, and it's 10 inches long. And that is not me and my wife in the picture. Those are Lego minifigures. A little bit of a stab in the back. Thanks, dear. Love you, too. Ended up buying her an electric vehicle that summer. But how can we get better at being content? in what God provides. Obviously, it's got to start with growing in our relationship with Jesus. That's the most important thing. But there are things we can practically do as guardrails to help ourselves stay in the lane of contentment. Reject, here's the first one, reject the cultural messaging that more stuff is better. Practically, financially, that is the purpose of basically every commercial and advertisement we see. You'll be happier if you buy this. And just recognize that. It's a lie. What, and this is John Mark Comer again, what if more stuff just equals more stress? More hours at the office, more debt, more years working in a job I don't feel called to, more time wasted cleaning and maintaining and fixing and playing with and organizing and reorganizing and updating all that junk I don't even need. What if more stuff actually equals less of what matters most? Less time, less financial freedom, less generosity, which according to Jesus is where the real joy is. Less peace as I hurry my way through the mall parking lot. Less focus on what life is actually about. Less mental real estate for creativity. Less relationships, less margin, less prayer, less of what I actually long for. Second thing we can do is practice simplicity. One definition in that book is to live with a high degree of intentionality around what matters most. And the implication is kind of let go of the stuff that doesn't. Jesus himself said it in Matthew 6:33. 
But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. First Timothy, we get some very direct instructions from the Apostle Paul, and it commands the rich. Chances are, if you're in this room, you're in the percentage of the world that's rich. Even college students, I know, it's bizarre. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, that they may take hold of that which is truly life. We have the opportunity in worship every Sunday to take our tithe, traditionally that's 10% of our income, and give it back to God as an act of worship. My identity, my security, my significance, my happiness isn't in this. It's in my relationship with Jesus. And I want to give him some of what he's given to me. It's being ready to share what we have for the benefit of others and being rich towards God. Initially, you read the Ten Commandments and they come across as a bunch of stuffy commandments, but it's God's loving way to show you he is a trustworthy and good provider and you can be content in his provision That perfect provision, we see it in Jesus. We see in ourselves our own covetousness and sin and need for Jesus. And God, like a loving Heavenly Father, patiently trains us to look to Jesus as our hope. So if you forget all the rest of what I said, remember this. Plead or beg or implore God to satisfy your longings, your wantings, for happiness, significance, security in a relationship with Him. And if you don't yet have that relationship, please don't walk away from this opportunity to come forward to receive prayer, to communicate and say, God, I need a relationship with you. Help me. I believe in you, Jesus. Whether you're online, don't turn this off before you have done that. If you have that relationship, then you are a follower of Jesus and He promises to never leave you nor forsake you. You don't need to hold tightly to the stuff you have to feel safe, but contentment is the freedom to let go of what wants to find you. As we read in Hebrews chapter 13, 5 and 6, this beautiful encouragement, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? I like what uh, some of the staff said this week on the subject. They said, if what we have is God, we can be content. Bank accounts aren't safe, but God cannot be hacked or taxed. And if we find contentment in God, that is quite a lot of content. We can read about that in Ephesians 1. Practically for me, personally for me, I have been praying through Psalm 119, not the whole chapter, just verses 35 to 37. And this is a prayer that I highly encourage you to adopt for yourself. It says, Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies, not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. Give me life in your ways. You see, I think David in Psalm 23 understood contentment in God's provision when he says, The the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Would you please stand with us? Would you sing in response these words? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory. Sing that one more time. And grace, turn your eyes. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of the light.